All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Soul Share episode, I'm very excited to have Jeff Karp here with me on the show. Jeff is a professor at Harvard Medical School and MIT and author of the new book, Lit, which teaches us how to use nature's playbook to energize our brains, spark ideas, and ignite action. Hey, hey, Jeff, welcome to the show, my friend. Hi, Brandon. So great to meet you. Yeah, looking forward to to, to diving in. Uh, diving in, it reminds me of another friend of mine who always uses the word lit. And I think he used it a lot in his book. Uh, so I'm curious to see where, where the overlaps are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us off with the uh, my cliche opening question, which oh. is this. You're in an elevator. The woman next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? You have 10 floors to answer. What do you say? My passion is following my curiosity, really. Um, I find I'm just curious about pretty much everything. And, um, and I feel like, you know, there's been times in my life where I haven't led with my curiosity. I've put up the, the guardrails and, and, you know, the sort of protectors, protect thyself, like, you know, the ego mm-hmm. kind of comes out. And I just find for me, it's just constantly finding ways to tap into my, my curiosity to be able to be observant of the world and um, to, to just be free flowing and, and, and let things go. I mean, I would just feel like the best things always happen to me and I have the best experiences and I always feel the best um, when I'm in those moments of just leading with, leading with my curiosity. I, I think, um, you know, I certainly have had the pat, lots of different passions over time, but I think, um, you know, those are, those kind of come and go and, uh, but, but consistently it's, it's just, yeah, finding ways to just be in the flow state of letting myself, um, connect with what my environment and, and, uh, and, and just learning. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, uh, You've certainly done some interesting things from the from the little that I know. I would love to hear, um, uh, you know, I, I guess whatever feels relevant to share regarding your backstory, just to give us all some context to, yeah, who you are and how you got here. Absolutely. And if it's okay with you, maybe I'll just read a page and a half from the book because I think that really sets, I've never done this before um, cool. in this format, but I, I think maybe it'll just set it, set it up for you um, if that's Perfect. okay. Yeah, right. whatever feels feels right. Let's do it. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So this is in the introduction. Um, One Boy's Journey to Lit. Mm-hmm. Um, as citizens of the 21st century, we often feel the world is spinning out of control, or at least out of our control. Catastrophe and dysfunction loom large in our minds. Anxiety and depression have been declared public health epidemics. Sometimes the ability to direct our lives seems so far out of our grasp that we just surrender. Unable to focus the way we want or resist the distractions and demands of the moment, we release ourselves to the torrent and simply react. To to horrific news, to flame-throwing tweets or texts, Hmm. to advertising and influencers, and to the omnipresent pull of media and social media algorithms with their own agendas. And I say this as an optimist who believes that humans have fundamentally good qualities and do care about creatures, including one another, and about the health of the planet. Even so, at times, it seems impossible to act with intention and create the lives we truly want to lead. But I'm optimistic for two reasons. One is that we're waking up to our place at this moment in time and to our potential as problem solvers on a planetary scale. Science, newly coupled with indigenous knowledge and deep expertise, continues to generate new evidence of the complex interconnections of life on this planet. With our emerging awareness of our role in the ecosystem and the complexities that arise from our choices, which are often damaging, we can see the need for fresh, innovative thinking. We can no longer act as though we don't know what's going on or what's at stake accepting cultural norms that ignore consequences, muddle our intuitive senses, and immobilize us. We're also increasingly aware that whatever our circumstances, we want our lives to have meaning and purpose. We want our relationships and work to be fulfilling. We want some happiness in the mix, and we know that we can't wait for someone else to make that happen. We've got to do it for ourselves. 
Best of all, neuroscience tells us that our brains are up to the task, plastic and malleable, hungry for the right challenge. Our brain is capable of creativity, new knowledge acquisition, and growth, even as we age. This much we own and control. It's our evolutionary inheritance, nature's playbook. We can choose to activate the neural networks that shake our brain awake, flip the switch to enliven our senses, and stimulate our thought process, processes beyond what we may have imagined possible. Where to start? How do we filter out the noise and distraction, overcome inertia and other obstacles to design the lives we want? How can we regain some control and switch on our innate abilities to focus on what matters most while still living amid the cacophony of modern life? The best people to teach us how to cope may be the very people who've struggled the most with attention and learning challenges. Many have refined the skills necessary to thrive in a world filled with constant stimulation, distraction, and stress. How do I know this? Because I'm one of them. Nice. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, um, yeah. So I definitely want to dive into the name and what it means to live lit and uh, you know what inspired you to write it. Uh, but before that, if you would just share a little bit, um, that intro was really helpful. Um, but what, you know, sort of a little bit of your, your background, you, as you said, you're one of them, uh, you know, could you share a little bit about your background and how you got to the point of writing this book? Absolutely. Um, so in the second grade, um, I just wasn't getting anything. Um, my mom tried flashcards. She tried phonics. Um, I couldn't, you know, pronounce most words. Um, I wasn't connecting socially with anybody. I'd sit at the back of the class, frustrated, demoralized, angry, um, and just kind of felt like an alien, really. And when the end of the year came by, um, the teacher called in my parents and had a meeting. And at that meeting, you know, he told them that he wanted to hold me back a year, repeat the second grade. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was struggling with undiagnosed ADHD and learning differences. Um, I didn't know it. My parents didn't know it. My teacher certainly didn't know it. And But my parents um, did something that was really important, I think, is they negotiated with the teacher that if I spent the summer with tutors to try to catch up, that I could go on to the third grade. Mm -hmm. So all my classmates went on summer vacation, and here I am um, you know, going in to meet with tutors every day. And I'll never forget, there was one day where I went in to meet with a tutor and um, she read me a passage, asked me some questions, I gave answers, and then she turned to me and looked me straight in the eye and she said, how did you think about that? She, and no one had ever asked me that question before and right. it was literally like a light bulb moment um, mm -hmm. Because it was this almost this flash of awareness, this sort of like portal opened up this canvas, where I could think about thinking, you know, kind of like metacognition. And I mean, I didn't know these terms at the time, but I just sure. felt this, this, this sort of like power, almost like this superpower in this moment was unlocked. Um, and nothing really changed in a dramatic way immediately after that. But I brought this newly found awareness to everything. And just I'll give you one example is I was just so distracted, you know, really extreme distraction. Um, in fact, at one point, my teacher, um, she put like blinders up on my desk and put a stopwatch on because I always couldn't like get things done in time. And, you know, all the other the children would make fun of me and things. And it just kind of created more anxiety um, uh, you know, I was just so always so distracted, but what I was able to do is I tuned into the power of questions at a very early age. So, so right, you know, in the, in the third grade, um, because I noticed whenever I asked a question, my brain would like hyper-focus just for a few moments mm -hmm. and whatever the answer was, you know, I would be able to pay attention very in a very focused manner and that would imprint in my mind. And then I'd be able to sort of like, it was almost like this process of knowledge entering my mind happened when I asked questions, but no, no other time. 
Um, and so I was like, huh, like maybe I need to use this as a way to, to learn. And so I started figuring out how to ask more and more intentional questions. Mm. And so really that was the beginning of my path to lit was, was being asked, how did you think about that? And then coming into this awareness, like I almost think of it today as like, um, like, let's say, and this isn't the best analogy, but just the one I'm thinking about in the moment, which is like, you know, my brain was almost like this computer. I had this hardware, which I was trying to figure out. I didn't really know too much about it. Um, but it was almost like the software was so primitive and I needed to program it. I needed to observe mm -hmm. patterns in other people and in myself and sort of update and create my own software in order to function. And so, um, which was extremely exhausting. I'd, I'd get home and, and be like angry and frustrated and exhausted um, from school every day. I couldn't really talk to anybody. Um, but that it was like a process that I engaged that really sort of, um, you know, I kept with it and, and, and was able to, to eventually make a lot of progress. And one other thing I'll say is, um, the school I was at didn't want to, um, they didn't have resources and they know much about like learning differences and, and things. So they didn't want to identify me, um, or help really in any way. So my mom prepared this massive file on me, went up against the school board herself, um, and actually got me identified as having learning differences, which got me so, a little bit extra time and space. And that was a transformational moment in the seventh grade. Um, so um, where things really just started to open up and all these tools I was developing, I was able to kind of put into practice. Wow. And what a, what a fascinating story to go from that to, you know, your, your special needs in a sense to, you know, what you, what you do now, uh, a professor at Harvard and MIT and like, wow, that, that really is such a great example of like, we need to look at these things from a different lens than what we've we've done right i mean we're we're it's the you know judging the fish by its ability to climb a tree thing and, exactly um i i hopefully i like to think the world has started to shift some probably since you were in second grade to be more aware of the differences but i don't know if we're quite caught up you know on the different ways that children and people in general you know learn and and you know, receive knowledge and, and information and, and process it. Yeah, I think, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, for, for, for better or worse, I mean, the education system, um, you know, is the way it is, um, you know, in some ways you can kind of look at it as like a factory um, mm -hmm. uh, for education. And, um, but I do think there, you know, there are better ways to do it. And, and the problem with the current education system is that, um, the, the people who end up being sort of um, not helped or maybe even harmed are those who are neurodiverse, who are, I mean, everybody is on, the, on a spectrum, you know, everybody is, is, is on a neurodiversity spectrum. Um, but the education system really, I think, um, the people who tend to be on more of the extremes, they fall through the cracks. And, um, but in some ways, everybody falls through cracks throughout the education system. In fact, there was this TED talk by Ken Robinson, I think it was like the most watched TED talk of all time, like 76 million times or something. And he talks wow. about how the education system actually educates people out of being creative. Mm. Um, and I thinking about this even more, I, I think the education system educates us out of asking questions, mm. uh, educate because, you know, we're, we're shamed often for asking like, a, you know, the stupid question. And then we, we don't ask questions. We don't improve our skill to ask questions. And you know, there's all kinds of things. I think that the education system. There's lots of good things, but there's also these challenge. The, like the, there's these these um, you know th these things that inhibit children. And and what I found in just you know I, I have had a lot of students go through my lab, all kinds of um, you know from all around the world. And you know one thing to me that's just certain is that we all have this incredible capacity for rewiring our brains and learning and neuroplasticity. It's like, it's like, I really believe it's our evolutionary inheritance. We all yeah. have that capability and we're using such a small fraction of our brain's capacity. Like, and, and, and I think for some people, they just thrive in the education system. For a lot of people, they don't. And people believe that they're not smart or they can't do certain things or they can't learn, but it's really just 
the process through which things are happening. Like I've found in my experience that if I'm not good at something, if I'm not progressing well, it's because I'm not engaging the right process that works for me. And that's what I really think um, you know, people generally need is to experiment with different processes, different systems of learning, different types of mentorship, different ways of engaging skills. And everybody, I believe, can find ways where they can you know, rapidly improve on things and, and really, um, you know, it's, it's extremely liberating when you start to tap into that and see that you actually have the ability to do better at everything. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, what, so let's fast forward up to writing, uh, lit and, you know, I'm, I'm curious what inspired, what is the inspiration for lit and, you know, the concept, what does that, what does that even stand for? So LIT stands for Life Ignition Tools, um, and it really describes, um, you know, I mean, I, I just, to, to, to me, it's, it's just tapping into its tools, like it's a set of 12 holistic tools, you know, tools that kind of are designed to work together um, <clears throat> to tap into what we've already all got, you know, within us. And, um, and I feel like, you know, we're in this sort of day and age where we're just like inundated with information, things coming at us from every angle. We're like in this kind of cloud, this fog, um, you know, $900 billion every year is spent on marketing efforts to essentially um, uh, hijack our attention and control what we define as important. And so, you know, we're really up against, um, you know, in, in sort of like video game talk, like a massive boss, right? Or multiple right. bosses, right? At, at, at once. And, um, and I think that we need tools to be able to, you know, disentangle the web that is in our minds to sort of like clear, clear things up to, to sort of like, um, you know, clear the palette, you know? Um, and to be able to start to connect with, um, with, with what's truly most important to us. I mean, I feel like we, we all have the capability of, 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 um, of clearing our minds in a way so that we start to see what we're really all about. And, to, um, and I think once we start to do that, it's extremely empowering. It's extremely liberating. And we start to get in touch with all of this, you know, our, our, our real fundamental true capacity to connect deeply with others and to connect with nature and to make deliberate decisions that really, um, that really help us, um, you know, feel a sense of well-being and, and fulfillment. And to me, that's what the lit tools, that's what lit is really all about. Hmm. Can you, can you share what some of those are like okay what, what you know obviously the book i'm sure goes deep um but uh you know give us some examples of of yeah lit tools absolutely one of the tools is called flip the switch and it's really about noticing our inner desire for possibility and that can be really in in anything in our relationships in our work in self evolution just sort of noticing that maybe there's something um, that we're not thinking of, that we're not trying, that we're not experimenting with, and sort of figuring out that maybe there's a step we could take that would open up an opportunity or a possibility um, that could really just bring fresh energy into our lives. Um, and this can happen like at any time. Like I'll give you an example. Um, so when I started my laboratory back in 2007, one of the first projects that we worked on in my lab um, was uh, taking stem cells out of the body, manipulating them um, so that we could infuse them intravenously right into a blood vessel and have them target different sites in the body. And um, we were literally on the cusp of a major breakthrough. We figured out a way to do this. I mean, the potential would be huge. You can imagine, you know, um, being able to take stem cells and target them to the heart um, to prevent someone who had a heart attack from going into heart failure or to wow. the brain to treat neurological conditions or um, to the intestine to treat inflammatory bowel conditions. Like the possibilities were endless. Wow. And um, there's the first major project in my lab. We had data, looked amazing. 
And I was like, okay, we're going to go start a company on this. Like this could really change the world. And um, so it's the night before I'm meeting with a major investor. I can barely sleep. Um, I'm just so excited. I go in, I give the presentation. I'm super confident, um, you know, kind of smirking because I feel I got this in the bag. And the investor leans across the table and goes, Jeff, this is really great, um, but we're going to pass. And I was like, what? You're going to wow. And, and then, I, you know, so it's kind of like those moments where I almost couldn't hear anything else that he was talking, but I wasn't listening anymore because yeah. I was like, pass. And then I managed to ask why. And he said, well, because your technology is too complicated. I, we had done this like five step process and it had a lot of complexity in it to, to mm -hmm. do what we, we, you know, we had achieved a great result, but it was just too complicated. And so, um, you know, I went back to my, my lab and, um, and what I realized though, is that when I encounter these challenges or these failures, usually I'm like, I'm very angry, you know, upset, mm -hmm. like devastated first major project of my lab. Like this was going to yeah. be career defining. And all of a sudden I'm being told this is not going to help anybody. Um, but I know that after two or three days, kind of emotions sort of settle and this yeah. almost like after the rain moment, you know, where yeah. this window opens up to gain the greatest insights and opportunities, you know, kind of see, see things from different angles, different perspectives. And it was a flip the switch moment for me because I was like, wait a moment. I was just told that this technology was too complicated. I'm at the beginning of my career and I was like, what if I take what I just learned and I apply it to every single project moving forward? What if I update my process, my strategy mm -hmm. for how I approach science based mm -hmm. on this interaction? And it was the question that none of us thought to ask, which is what happens after something leaves the lab? Yeah. And so I decided I needed to ask that question um, for every project. And out of this, this concept of radical simplicity was born in my lab, which is the art and discipline of minimizing complexity at all levels. So complexity only when necessary. And mm -hmm. I flipped the switch because I was able, I sort of, I noticed this inner desire for possibility that I need to do something here. I just learned something major. This is really a hard moment because, you know, it was like, a, like this, it blew up what I was trying to do. But yeah. instead of just sort of, being, you know, shaming myself and, and digging myself into the ditch about what just happened, um, I noticed that there were other possibilities and mm -hmm. the possibility was being served to me. You know, it was like, mm -hmm. here's a key. And, and so I took those insights and I updated how we approach science from that moment forward. And almost every major project in my lab now has um, been, um, been the formation of a, a new company. Um, wow. that's been, you know, bringing, uh, technologies into clinical trials and to patients. Wow. Wow. That's fascinating. So really just understanding, um, you know, the, um, <laughs> I think of an old business partner who would say, kiss, keep it simple, stupid, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, so, so really just keeping, I, I think in all areas of business, so it makes sense you know, in the lab, anywhere, how do you take the complexity out of it as much as possible? So is that really what you're saying that you've done with all your, your projects after that is like, okay, simplicity is like a key piece of the puzzle here. And if it's not simple, then we steer clear. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So what I noticed was that in order to maximize innovation in my lab, I needed to have very simple mantras that I could keep coming back to that could be almost like guideposts for the projects. Yeah. And so it was in a way, it was beyond just keeping it simple. It was bringing an awareness to all of our decisions and everything that we do, you know, thinking about the end goal, the end goal, the North star is we want to help patients. We want this to have maximal impact in society. And we can only do that if our technologies are simple enough. And so it was really bringing that kind of energy into the yeah. projects. Yeah. And so, you know, it sort of formed mm -hmm. the foundation of, of every project. We have multiple discussions around, 
you know, can we simplify this? Sometimes we can't. And so we'll continue, you know, just to get a proof of concept and then we'll come back to it and try to simplify it. So I think it is, it really is about simplicity, but it's almost just like the energy of, of purpose, you know? Yeah. So in, and where simplicity is, is one of the key goals, but it's sort of like, how do we infuse projects with that purposeful energy? Because once you start bringing that in, it has a domino effect. So we start thinking about other things too, like what are the clinical trials going to look like and who's going to fund this? And, and um, you know, like there's all the, can, can this be manufactured? Can we patent it? Like we start to really bring up conversations that are very important conversations that differentiate from just standard academic science. So in a standard lab, you just publish papers and then you move on and do new research and publish papers. What we're trying to do is take an approach where the goal is not to publish papers, but actually to develop a technology that can make it right. into hospitals that doctors could use and benefit lives of patients. And so we need a different energy, a different way of kind of going about our projects. So it's almost like the whole ethos of, of what we do. Yeah. Right, right. Very cool. Um, and you've had some success since adopting that aim, uh, if you will. Can can you share some of the the you know technological developments you've helped to bring into the world? Absolutely. Um, so one of the technologies we developed. Um, um, well, actually, maybe I'll say just to start. What one of the things that I notice, and and you know, I kind of mentioned this in the context of of lit, is that one of the main goals of lit is to intercept patterns right and i think that we tend to in our lives just do what we've experienced you know so if we're like for example you know i i, I did my phd in a laboratory i did some work in a laboratory in my undergrad and my postdoc i worked in a laboratory and then i started my own laboratory and i found the tendency was just to replicate what i had experienced before but yet there's this opportunity to experiment and sort of make it more my own, right? I feel everyone has that, that possibility in everything they do. And to me, I sort of, so I noticed that by being in these environments, I was just repeating patterns of what I saw because they were effective for other people. But I realized some of these things were not effective for me. Like it wasn't working out the same way. And, um, and so, and I feel like in projects, things are like that too. So lit is, is designed to intercept those patterns, right? Because we just often mimic what we've seen before. Um, so for example, like how we apply for grants, how we um, write research papers, how we go about asking scientific questions, like there's different ways of doing it. Um, and, and I realized that we were just kind of getting into ruts and, and doing incremental science. And I thought, okay, well, how can we break free from this? And I discovered, and there's a story behind it, but um, I discovered that turning to nature for inspiration, mm. um, it was kind of a breakthrough for the lab because it was a way to get ourselves out of the laboratory and to think completely differently about our science and the way that we conduct science. So, for example, um, a heart surgeon approached us uh, in 2009 from Boston Children's Hospital who wanted to help, who, who wanted to work with us to try to um, seal holes in between the chambers of the heart. So one in 200 or 300 babies that are born have um, a congenital heart defect and, and a percentage of them require surgery. Is that and, like a murmur? Yeah. So it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of different um, um, kind of heart issues, you know, that can happen. Um, the heart, heart murmur can kind of affect the heartbeat and, you know, cause irregularities. Um, this is even more serious than that, where there would literally be a hole in between oh, the wow. chambers of the heart and would wow. require surgery to correct it. And so he said, you know, I, I, I have trouble sealing these holes because these kids are so young and the tissue is so fragile, you can't suture it, you can't put stitches in it. Wow. Um, and nothing really works. And so, um, we started to work on a technology and we, we couldn't get anything to work. And so we, we said, okay, you know what, what if we turn to nature for inspiration? It was kind of like a little bit of a wild idea for, for us because, you know, we hadn't been doing too much of it, but the idea was 
hundreds of millions of years of research and development happening all around us. Right. Um, you know, anything that's alive today, a plant or animal is here because it solved insurmountable challenges, problems. So right, right. we're like surrounded by ideas. And so we said, okay, well, what creatures exist in wet dynamic environments? What creatures um, can stick to surfaces where water is sort of, you know, hitting them and they're not falling off. So we looked at sandcastle worms. These are worms that sit on rocks in the sea. The waves are hitting them and they're not falling. They're remaining stuck to these rocks. Um, and then, you know, snails, for example, sometimes you'll see a snail on a leaf and it's raining and it's not falling off. It's just stuck there. And so we started looking at these creatures that exist in these environments where there's water that's kind of sloshing around and the creatures remain stuck. And we found things like properties of um, these creatures that um, were, were, we had never thought of before and things that we could, could bring into our science. Like, like these creatures actually had what are called hydrophobic agents that were in these secretions that repel water. Mm -hmm. um, and we're like, okay, what if we make a glue that when you put it into the heart, I mean, the heart is such a crazy environment for a glue to work because you have like 60 beats per minute on average, blood's Shit. rushing through, you got expansion, yeah. contraction cycles, and every surface is covered with blood. So we made, a, we, we made this glue that mimicked what we saw in nature and we could repel the blood from the surface of the heart and have the glue infiltrate into the heart. And then we, we made it photo curable so we could shine light on it. And we got this glue literally to seal holes inside a beating heart. And we were able to get regulatory approval in Europe to use the glue for sealing blood vessels and now we're using the glue. There's two clinical trials going on, one in Australia for um, nerve reconstruction and another one in Australia for, um, uh, for hernia repair. Wow, that's impressive. Very cool. I mean, I love the idea of, of course, looking to nature and, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a research and development lab that uh, has been at it for quite some time. And, uh, yeah, just very, very fascinating. Um, and I, I love the, the approach that you're taking with your work too, to just like, okay, yeah, let's not just like have things in a lab that are interesting and move on. Let's find a path to implementation and, and remove the obstacles that, you know, um, so that's, that's, that's really, really inspiring. Um, I'm curious, you know, going back to a little bit to the, to the book, I, I know you talk about the different, um, uh, you know, energy states of the brain, high energy versus low energy. And, um, can you speak to that? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that, that, um, really struck me in my journey is how I just feel like I always gravitate towards this low energy brain state where my brain anticipates what comes next. It's kind of like autopilot mode, you know, energy saver mode, um, where it's like, I don't want to put in the work to do anything. I just want to sort of run the algorithms or the patterns. I want to stay on my couch. I want to just kind of eat what I'm eating. Um, and, uh, you know, just sort of repeat every day what, what's happening. And I, I feel myself gravitating towards that. And, and so the, I refer to that as, as the, the low energy brain state. Mm. And I realize, you know, in my laboratory, for example, that that actually harms us, that when we do low energy thinking, um, we're essentially just getting the results that everybody else has gotten. And we're not really innovating. We're not being creative. We're not sort of tapping into all of this potential that we all have. And so that's one of the, the, the kind of key things I think about Lit is that I have been trying to develop tools that allow us to break free from this low energy brain state so we can really tap into what's already there to get us into a higher energy brain state to do our best thinking. And so turning to nature is one example of of getting ourselves into the high energy brain state, because what it does is 
Um, you know, I don't think I've had a single person in the lab where we're doing something bio-inspired and they're not like fired up about it, you know, because I think it just stokes people's curiosity. The fact that, you know, when you learn about creatures and what they've evolved um, to deal with changes in their environment, it's just, it's so fascinating. It's like, you know, this like awe-inspiring moment. And, um, and so to me, um, you know, I think I've been on this path to try to find ways to, to get my brain into that higher energy state where I feel we do our best thinking, where we can maximize our ability to be creative and lead with curiosity and be connected with others. And while I do feel like the ground sort of state is there and I'm kind of pulled towards it, I recognize it now. And by the way, I think there's like an evolutionary sort of basis for this. I think it's you know, 12 to 15,000 years ago, when we were all kind of hunter gatherers, you know, out on the savannah, the goal was really energy conservation, you know, for right. survival, um, where, you know, you never know when, when we were going to deplete our resources and need to move and conserve our energy to move to a completely different location or run away from something or go hunt something. So right. generally, you know, we have this sort of energy saver mode for survival purposes. And this, this is kind of, uh, you know, it, it's still with us. It's still very much a part of us. Um, but what I've realized, so through kind of tapping into these tools that we all have access to, um, that we can override that system, that we can, we can say, hey, that, this is not serving us. And there's many things that we can do um, because it's just, it's not a fulfilling state to be in, um, you know, most of the time to, 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 to just sort of, you know, and in fact, if we think of exercise, just as one example, um, evolution from an evolutionary perspective, we weren't, uh, we didn't evolve to exercise, like exercise wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense to go out and, and go for a run for no apparent reason. And then, because later on that evening, you may have to go hunt and now you're, you're out of energy, you know? So so we need to come up with tools and strategies and systems um, to help us to really, you know, tap in to lead fulfilling lives and and have a, a you know this sense of wellness, especially in this modern society where our culture is, um, you know, just feeding us information and and really I think um, cognitively we're just overloading our our brains constantly. We need to find a way to to, to separate ourselves from that and um, and to really be with with um what what we what we got yeah yeah um yeah it makes a lot of sense uh you know when you think of it in those terms it's like yeah we go out of our way to expend energy uh exercising or something i mean i did it this morning right and that would have made no sense to our ancestors at all um i never really thought about it like that but very true um but you know what, actually, I will say one thing, though, is that to me, you know, there's one of the um, one of the tools uh, I, I call um, get hooked on movement. And, um, you know, I think movement is really important as a way to, you know, when we move, when we exercise, we create a domino effect in everything in our lives. It's not just, you know, exercising to look good or to, to feel good, but it, it actually opens the door to helping us like, you know, floods our brain with neurotransmitters and oxygen, and it helps different regions of our brain sort of communicate with, with each other uh, more efficiently. Um, And it just, it, 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 it gets us in a state where we get the ball rolling down the hill and we can do more of what we want to do. It becomes easier to be intentional and deliberate and purposeful, you know, in our lives. So I, I exercise is something that even though we have this evolutionary pull against it, um, I think it is so important for just overall sense of well-being beyond, yeah. you know, the physical benefits that we get from it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the myriad of, of benefits for sure. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to hear you speak to something that I think a lot of people deal with is feeling um, victimized or uh, overcoming self-doubt, that kind of thing. Um, What is your perspective on that? Well, I think that um, I would probably even throw into that, um, into that bucket, like shame, self-shame. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I I think, um, you know, one of the things actually that, that I, um, try to do is um, I'll just give you just one example. Like, let's say if I send an email to somebody, um, 
and uh, they don't respond right away, right? And I immediately start to think to myself, okay, what did I do? Like, um, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Or, you know, is there something like, um, what's wrong with me, right? Right, right. Um, But I found a way actually to intercept that and to completely flip it. And it's super simple. And so what I do is I sort of just pause in the moment when I'm doing that. And I say, okay, well, why do I think that way? Why is my reaction to think um, that there's something wrong with me? And then I flip it by saying, the reason that you're thinking about this is because you care. Mm. And to me, one of the sort of values that, you know, one of the things that is really important to me is that I outwardly and inwardly do care, right? I really want to care. I want to care about the people around me. I want to care about what I'm doing, my work. I want to care about my relationships. I want to care about myself. And, And so as soon as I flip it from this sort of like outward shaming to caring that it's actually highlighting the fact that I'm thinking about this is because I really do care, right? I want to connect with this person I've just sent an email with. Like I want to yeah. build yeah. something with them. I want to further the relationship with them. I want to, I want them and I to exchange energy. Um, and when I think about it in terms of care, it's almost like the rest of it disappears and mm. I just go with the care. Mm. And so it ends up being a very positive thing and I feel good mm. about it. And so I just, I feel like we have so many things like that in our lives where the underlying sort of motivation for a certain thing we may do is, is actually good, but we see the surface level negativity. And I feel like if we can kind of get under that and connect Mm. with why we're sort of feeling a certain way, um, you know, it just can, I think it can open things up. It can help us see things from a different perspective. Mm, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. It's, um, you know, if you if you can tap into, okay, I'm being caring and I'm I'm putting myself out there and I'm um, well intended. It's almost like what someone does or doesn't do with that energy is really on them. I've been the thing that I'm striving to be, and therefore I'm a success as a caring, you know well-intended, thoughtful individual, right? Absolutely. The the other way that I use it too, by the way, is um, let's say I'm speaking, you know, I'm having, let's say, a conversation with my children or my my wife, and I sort of get an impulse to say something, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's something on my mind, I want to say it. And, but I know it just doesn't feel right. It feels like maybe like I'm going to take the energy away from them or the focus away from them, or it's like, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and I just pause and let it pass. Yeah. In that moment, I just, I say to myself, like, that's a win, you know, Mm. that's, that's a win, you know, that I didn't say that. And I can't tell you how good that feels in the moment and how empowering it is just to say that to myself, you know, silently, um, and just sort of sit with that for a moment, because it just, it it sort of reaffirms that I'm on the right path, the path I want to be on. You right. know, right. and and to me, when I start doing that again, there's like this domino effect that happens. It's easy. It becomes more easy to do it because yeah. anything we think, any of our actions, any of our emotions impacts our neuroplasticity, the rewiring of our brain. Right. And so if we pause in those moments and sort of flip it to I care or that's a win, I didn't say something that was going to deflect the whole conversation to me or suck the energy out of, you know, like a conversation yeah. or whatever it is then we start to have this positive reinforcement and our brains, it becomes easier to do it. We start noticing other moments where we can bring this to. And I think the more, you know, frequently we do that, you know, can be helpful. And I'll I'll mention one other thing that I do, which is um, there's this app. I I learned about it on on another podcast, but it's called Mind Jogger. And um, this app is, it's, it's incredibly simple, deceptively simple, but, but incredibly powerful. Um, So what you do is um, you can enter like one sentence, one phrase, um, even a one word, and you ping yourself like you could say, okay, between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., I'm going to ping myself 10 times or five times or two times randomly. Mm. And so I put just as I've been experimenting. So I'll put in there like one sentence. You can do it. Right. Mm. You can do it. Mm. And so I get pinged randomly throughout my day with this Mm. ping that says, you can do it regardless of what I'm doing. If I'm in a conversation or, you know, if I'm just sort of, you know, whatever I'm doing. 
and again, that energy, it just like, it, it can flip a moment for me. Um, cool. and, um, you know, and I've put, I've, I've experimented as well with, um, you know, like, like, um, who are you judging? You know, I've put that in as well in this moment, uh, um, mm. just to sort of, you know, ping me in terms of like, oh, am I, you know, cause it, it, it makes me reflect on things that are really important to me, things that I want to change. Um, and I forget who said this, but like one on one of the podcasts I listened to, they, the question they put is, are you above or below the line? Meaning mm. like the line is like, are you in a good positive like headspace mm -hmm. or a negative headspace? And so I was like, you know what? I feel like I'm in a negative headspace, but I just don't know. So I put it on, I did it like for multiple days and it was like once in two or three days, I'd be in a negative headspace, but like nine times out of 10 or whatever it is, I'd be in a pot and I'd be like, wow, that things are actually going really well. I'm just focused on that one negative moment that I had and yeah. I've latched onto it. So it's like, okay, now I know I need to do the work um, so that I don't make that my reality. That's really the exception to the, you know, my reality. Cool. I love that. Yeah. I'm going to check that out. It's a, it's a, like you said, very simple, but powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great way to just constantly rewire. And it makes me think of a friend who sets an alarm to, um, he has alarms all throughout the day where it's like, okay, take a moment and breathe into your heart like mm. you know, three times deeply and it'll, his alarm will go off and he'll do it every time, you know? So. Well, I love um, that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know one of the things yeah. that has really helped you on your own personal journey has, um, is meditation as well. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, I always love to hear about people's experience and takeaways and benefits with, with that tool. So I like experiment a little bit here and there with meditation, never really, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I hear people talk about it and then mm -hmm. I would, would try something, but just like once I really didn't give it a chance, but when COVID hit, and we all had this sort of like, you know, unintentional pause. Yeah. Um, my world kind of came crashing down, actually, literally in, in my living room. Um, I realized I had, you know, I, I had been struggling so much when I was a kid um, that I needed to develop ways to be efficient. I needed to develop ways to um, be productive um, you know, in a very short period of time, because it always took me a long time to figure things out. Like, what was the teacher really asking me? I can tell, like, maybe there's five, 10 possibilities, but I don't know which is the right one. And so I spent a huge part of my life just improving efficiencies and trying to be more productive. And when COVID hit, I um, had this realization that I was like, oh my God, it's like, I, my kids were young. I looked up, my kids were now older, both teenagers, and they had kind of stopped coming to me. Um, I'd become a workaholic. Um, and I was just feeding off of, you know, the dopamine and the other neurotransmitters and, mm. and, uh, you know, which feel good in the moment. But, you know, these, the things that were most important to me, you know, like the, in my life, my family, I was not, um, you know, I'd, I'd become disconnected. Um, my wife and I were almost like, you know, two ships passing in the night, you know, <laughs> like it was really, really big disconnection. And so <clears throat> this was actually another flip the switch moment for me because I noticed this inner desire for possibility that there was something more, there was something different and I didn't know what it was. I, I couldn't figure it out. Um, so the other part of flip the switch is, is, sort of taking stock of what's working, what's holding me back. And things were going amazing in my lab, um, but they just weren't, you know, I wasn't connecting with my family. And I then, you know, started to notice there were other possibilities and other ways of, of thinking, other ways of going about it. Um, and I started to think about it and try to bring awareness to it. And I couldn't figure it out and I couldn't figure it out. And then one day I just sort of, I was observing my wife and I was like, oh my God, this is it. My wife had been engaging with a number of spiritual leaders, you know, as she was interested in all these questions she had. And um, she would talk about it. And, you know, I would listen, but I never really processed it. And in that moment, I was able to process it. Mm. And I said to my wife, Jessica, I said, would you please 
introduce me to your teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, I need, I want, I need to talk to them, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I started to talk to them. I started to, um, to, to really embrace, um, spirituality, which I, I hadn't done in any significant way in my life before. Um, and, I started seriously experimenting with meditation. I stumbled upon transcendental meditation. You know, it was one word that you kind of repeat over and over. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I went to the ceremony and I, I did it and I started practicing it in the morning and the evening. And all of a sudden I was like, wait a moment. Um, I'm actually able to get into this observer mode. I was able to th- see these thoughts come into my mind and then leave. And my normal sense would be to latch onto it and just be impulsively react to the thought. But I was finally able to have things enter my mind and then dissipate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd never experienced that before. Um, I think, you know, one time I, I tried psychedelics in a, um, when I was in uh, grad school in Toronto Mm -hmm. and I will never, it was a very actually similar, it reminded me of that moment because there was a moment where I almost could feel thoughts coming into my mind, Mm. sticking around for a second and then leaving and a new thought coming in. Like I was, I was in touch with that in real time. Like it was, Mm. I was wild. And so when I started meditating, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is kind of similar to that. Like I could, feel the thoughts leaving and coming in and I could feel the emotions start to get, but then the emotions didn't latch on and it just dissipated and then the emotions dissipated. And that was revolutionary for me because it allowed me to really shift from being impulsive um, to being more aware and being more, being able to really create that pause between stimuli and response. And I'll give you an example. So now when I'm speaking, and my relationships improved with my children, my, my, my wife and extended family, because now when I'm having a conversation, let's say with my children, I notice my, my sort of, um, my brain is like, Oh, you should say that. Like there, there's like, you know, okay, like something I should say or something funny I should say or or make a joke out of it or whatever it is. And I think to myself, wait a moment, if I do that, I'm gonna shift the energy from them to me. They're gonna stop talking. Um, and and now it's all about me. And this isn't about me. This is about them. This is about them expressing themselves and you know, I want to encourage and support them. So they'll just continue to talk and figure out, you know, who they are and and, and gain confidence in their ideas and their thoughts. And so it's allowed me to just pause in conversations mm. so that I'm not, you know, I kind of have this like, you know, I, I'm sort of in touch with my, my ego, my insecurities, and I'm able to sort of say, hey, 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 you don't need to take over this room. You don't need yeah, to, right. you know, suck the energy out of this moment. You can just like, just, you're good, you're good. Right. And then it just it opens things up in an incredible it's like way moving into a different sense of um self worth and self power in a sense that supports the situation in a different way exactly yeah yeah and it it's just cause you know i've been able to more deeply connect with people and just with everybody even and and yeah. the other thing yeah. that it's led to even in my work is when i go meet with people now before i have meetings i say to myself this is the most important person in their Mm. lives that I'm meeting with. Mm. And it just kind of creates this, this starting point of humility, you know, Mm -hmm. when I walk into the room to meet with people and, um, and I feel like I need these guardrails. I need these tools in conversations just to kind of keep myself in check. Cool. Well, as we start to wind down here, I'm curious if you have, you know, as the listeners know, I love to hear a good, uh, good synchronicity story or serendipity story or a positive paranormal story even. And I'm curious if you have anything sort of inspiring up your sleeve to share. Sure. Um, there's a bunch of things. Um, and maybe I'll just start before going there. Um, some, maybe like a segue to that, which is, um, uh, you know, a, a few months ago, I was looking out my window and I saw, you know, a bunch of trees that we can see um, from my kitchen. And I saw a tree kind of like wave, like it was moving and almost looked like it was waving at me. Hmm. And in my mind, I thought, okay, 
I can interpret this in two different ways in that moment. I was like, I can interpret that that tree is actually waving at me. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that feels amazing. Like, wow, the tree is like waving at me. And then the other thought is I could be like, nah, the tree's just blowing in the wind, <laughs> you know, and that's it. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm really into sort of like, you know, thinking about experiences in terms of like, how can I really step into the moment to really maximize the experience? And I'm like, okay, well, I, if I believe the tree is waving at me and that makes me feel good, then why wouldn't I go with that? Right. And right. so that to me um, is just one example of how I've been trying to interact with the world and nature and sort of see that the magic, you know, that's, that right. really is all around us. Um, yeah. And so now in, when I take the dogs for walks, um, you know, I go up to trees, put my hand on them and I close my eyes and I just let my mind wander. Um, mm. and you know, I kind of become a tree hugger as well, I would say. Cool. Um, so <laughs> just throwing that out there. Um, but you know, one example actually is when, um, when my, my, uh, son was in the seventh grade and, um, in the, um, he was kind of fallen through the cracks, I would say a little bit in the school system and, um, that's in, in, in definitely in need of something different. And, um, my wife, um, Jessica, um, she, you know, he, you know, he was thinking, okay, well maybe for high school, we'll, we'll have to find a, a specific school that's really going to be able to be good for him. And so she, um, she reached out to this one school, um, in the Boston area, um, and just said, I want to inquire about whatever, blah, blah, blah. And she gets a phone call like an hour or two later. And, and this is literally, um, it's like August, I don't know, 25th, 26th, like right before the new school year is going to start. And the person reaches out and says, Hey, I'm calling from the admissions office. I see here that, um, you are inquiring for your son, um, for the eighth grade. And my wife was like about to say, no, 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 it's for like the next year. And she said, but I want to let you know we have a position available. Um, we rarely have a position available at this school, um, but we just like we had someone who wasn't able to make it. A spot just opened up. We just got wow. your email. And um, and so what ended up happening was my son ended up going to this school in the eighth grade, like three days later, or four days wow. later. He started in that school and it was a transformational experience for him. Like it, it literally changed his life in so many ways. Um, and it was one of these things where my wife had mistakenly checked a box saying it was for this year instead of the following year. Um, but it, it, it was exactly what he needed. Wow. Like it was, it was literally. She was, so she was really just like way out ahead for the following year. Yeah. And, um, and, and then. He ended up there three days later. He ended up, yeah. So we ended up going on to Target like the next day, you know, going and getting all the supplies and everything that wow. he needed. Um, and um, yeah, and 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 I mean, it's hard for me to explain how transformational that year was. Wow. But he met teachers that interested him in subjects he wasn't interested in before, and it was like a massive point of inflection for his life. Like it, it, it just transformed everything for him. I love that. I love that. What, a, what an inspiring mishap. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, this has been awesome, Jeff. Uh, if you would, please tell the listeners the best way to connect, obviously where to find the book and, you know, continue to, to, to follow you. Absolutely. Um, so I have a website. It's my name, jeffcarp.com, uh, carp with a K. Um, and you can find out all about the book there um, and, uh, and the tools. Um, I'm also offering a, a bunch of content that's, that's not in the book. Um, so people can go on and, and, uh, and check that out. Um, and then I also have um, an overview of what's happening in my laboratory and some of the, some of the technologies that we're developing. Um, so you can find, find everything there. Very, very cool. Well, I do have one uh, final question for you. It's uh, my cliche closer, and it is this. In 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life, according to Jack Harp? The meaning of life to me is um, it's really about um, tuning into this um, this unbelievable ability that we all have 
to um, to grow and to expand our minds and to learn from one another um, and to really um, attune to the rhythms of life um, in the most meaningful ways possible, um, which is where I think we all thrive. I mean, to me, it's 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 about the the deep emotional experiences that we can have with each other and by being out in nature and just feeling connected within this interconnected ecosystem which we all depend on and we all contribute to and and um and and i think that it just it it's 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 when we get into that state we start to really feel the the magic we feel um, this incredible sense of well-being, and um, and I, I think there's you know there's 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 nothing that compares to it, and we all have access to that. And mm-hmm. to me, it's about how do we how do we break through these patterns, this fog, um, mm-hmm. so that we can strip it all away and really just um, deeply connect with with within this wondrous web of life, which we are all a part of. Amazing, yeah. How do we tap into the greatest and grandest version of ourselves and in in our evolution, essentially, right? Absolutely. Well, Jeff, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom and uh, congrats on on the book release and all the cool things that you're up to. Uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to follow uh, what you're up to in the world. And uh, yeah, all of you out there for tuning in your beautiful brainwaves and incredible hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time, journey well. Thank you.